Hello everyone, I'm Bart. And I'm Mira. And we're here to talk to you about the blending of fantasy and reality in the award-winning 2006 movie, Pan the Labyrinth. You know, it's interesting that Guillermo del Toro, the screenwriter, director, and producer of Pan's Labyrinth, chose Spain as the film's setting since del Toro himself is from Mexico. Yeah, but his upbringing in the violence of Mexico inspires the violence in his movie, according to an interview he did with The Guardian. Still, to put in as much detail as he did, he must have done a lot of research on the post-Civil Wars in Spain. I understand you've researched that a good bit as well, Art. Oh yeah, but we'll get to that later. For right now, I want to talk about the movie itself. It's amazing to see how Del Toro expertly weaves the harsh, unforgiving reality of the fantastical world in this film. Yes, and we're going to look at a couple of specific scenes that really show off those skills of his. First up is that horrific and climactic scene where the mandrake dies, leading to the death of Ophelia's mother. This was a great scene in the movie, perfectly blending the fiction and reality. I completely agree. The use of the mythological mandrake to affect the reality of pregnancy and childbirth just displays the mastery of Del Toro. You think there's a purpose in using the mandrake? Of course there is. Let me first delve into the actual stories behind mandrakes. According to some legends, it is the plant of the devil, a plant related to demons underground. The roots were apparently magical, but difficult to dig up as they had deadly screeches. That's some scary stuff. Are there any other tales regarding mandrakes? Yes, actually. The mandrake is also thought to be a plant with sexual properties, providing fertility. It has been found in Genesis of the Bible, in the story of Jacob and Leah. In this story, a mandrake is given in return for Jacob's seed between two sisters. I didn't know that, but why do you think Del Toro wanted to include the mandrakes as one of the fairy tales in this film? Well, for one thing, Del Toro probably became enamored with the mandrake in reading fantasy. According to his friend Alejandro Gonzalez, he has a vast library filled with books of fantasy. As for including it here, it really provided him an opportunity to incorporate a classic fairy tale of its healing and fertility properties. It also showed that Ophelia's fantasy world affects reality. It's not separate from it. That's wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. Del Toro is such an amazing artist. Now, going back to the historical aspect of this mostly fantastical film, the Spanish Marquis are portrayed in this film as the rebel that Ophelia's new father, Captain Vidal, to destroy. So, why are the Maquis such a target of hatred by the captain? Well, Pan's Labyrinth takes place in post-Spanish Civil War in the 1940s, under the Francoist regime that Captain Vidal tries to enforce, regardless of circumstance. How did the Spanish Maquis fit into this whole thing? Basically, the exiled rebels that Toro depicts are an example of many of the real rebel, rebel groups that existed in Spain at the time. Guerrilla warfare was a tactic that they often employed, which you can see in the scenes where they bomb the train and try to raid Captain Vidal's store. The scene in which the rebels attempt to fend off the captain is arguably one of the most sickening scenes of the movie. Each survivor is picked off one by one with shots to the head. Yes, and unfortunately this was a common thing in post-Civil War Spain. The Franco's regime stopped at nothing to crush the rebellions. I'm interested as to why Del Toro would decide to use this specific piece of history as the setting for such a seemingly different story. I think he uses this because of the sharp contrast between the fictional world that Ophelia involves herself and uh, reality. It really serves as a great point of juxtaposition. And according to his DVD commentary, he thought setting would be relevant to his audience in light of the War of Terror. Okay. Del Toro really is just a complex and powerful director. In what other ways do you think he's do you think he juxtaposes fantasy and history? Well, the relationship between Mercedes and the Spanish Marquis is very similar similar to that of Ophelia in the fantastical world. What do you mean by that? Think about it. Ophelia and Mercedes both are involved with a secret group that has looked down upon. Mercedes tries to help the Marquis despite heavy opposition from her boss, Captain Vidal. Similarly, Ophelia is involved with the fantastical world, with the fauna and fairies that her mother claims does not exist and is unhealthy to think about. That's a great point. I never thought of those separate relationships as being even remotely similar. This really is a prime example of how Del Toro blends fantasy and reality. Yes, it is, Mira. So what's our next scene? 
The next scene we're going to analyze is actually our last, and one of the last scenes in the movie, that unforgettable display of Mercedes holding Ophelia's body, surrounded by the rebels, while in the meantime, Ophelia is entering into her kingdom and seeing her parents. That scene definitely sums up all the elements of the movie, with Mercedes humming representing the domestic side, the rebels providing a historical aspect, and the great hall with Fauna and Paris showing off the fantasy world. But doesn't the fact that Ophelia has to die to reach the kingdom kind of make the existence of the fantasy world ambiguous? That's kind of the point. Del Toro is emulating stories like Alice in Wonderland and The Wizard of Oz here, except with a little more gruesomeness than simply awakening from a dream. However, despite the gritty scenes, there is still a glimpse of hope with elements from Christianity and a prevailing force from history. That's his style. And now that I think about it, there's no denying that the fantasy world did exist. Ophelia did get muddy when she wanted to kill that frog. Her mother got better and worse, depending on the state of the mandrake. And Ophelia was able to get to the captain's quarters to get her brother, something she couldn't have done unless the chalk really did exist. You're absolutely right, Parth. That ending scene doesn't take away from the meaning of the movie at all. It only adds to it, making it a masterful stitching of history and fiction. Not, not to mention the fact that Del Toro throws some religion into the scene, as well as fantasy and reality. What do you mean by that? Well, there are aspects of Christianity tied to the scene. Del Toro is, in fact, Catholic, and there is a strong similarity to Christ in the way that Ophelia enters her kingdom. She was only able to enter because she gave her own blood rather than someone else's. This directly re relates to the crucifixion of Christ. I actually heard that Del Toro calls himself a lapsed Catholic, but you're right that adding elements of Catholicism and Christianity is one of his trademarks. You can catch glimpses of this throughout the movie. It's even, it's ever, it's even present in the scene with the pale man. His feast is like the Last Supper, and Del Toro even said in the interview that the pale man represents, and I quote, the church the devouring of the children. It kind of sounds like he's no big fan of the church, doesn't it? Yeah, it really does. A lapsed Catholic indeed. Well, it looks like we've touched base on most of the important scenes in the movie. It was really great to clearly see the integration of so many parts in Pan's Labyrinth. I mean, Del Toro covered fairy tales, religion, history, and domestic life. What a genius. I really enjoyed the scope of reference in this film. I look forward to more works by Del Toro. I would recommend this film for anyone. Watch us again next, next time for our review of The Chronicles of Narnia.